The nights grew ever darker. It seemed that the gloom thickened above the heads of the people, impenetrable, cold, and threatening, as if a disease had struck the city. Usually noisy after sunset, it now fell silent, died out, and anxiety grew over the cobblestone streets. It drifted like a weightless mist between the houses, peeked into windows, lurked in cold alleys, and stared at people with blind black eyes. Prayers to the seven gods rose more frequently in the temples, but the small lights of the candles flickered and went out under the gusts of icy wind that crept under clothing, gripping pliant souls with the claws of fear. Fewer and fewer hunters returned from raids. They stayed there, in the forests, in abandoned cities, in dead villages. Blood soaked into the greedy earth, watered the dry steppe, flowed into streams and rivers. Life for life, death for death, that was their fate. Avon sat grimly at the table in the common hall, staring blankly at the oak tabletop, absent-mindedly tugging at his hair with his fingers. The city Godwin had described would never fade from the memory of the seasoned hunter. The skeletons of houses gaped blindly at the gray sky covered like a shroud with greenish-blue moss. Rotten beams creaked threateningly, telling their story with the worn cobblestones, chipped by hundreds of feet and hooves. The once majestic temple in the square had sagged under its own weight, and inside was complete devastation. The altar was split in two, the walls were broken, strange, thin, but incredibly deep scratches stretched across the floor covered in stone dust, as if an unknown blade had sliced through the marble-like butter. And the thick smell of decay, haunting the dejected hunters everywhere in every house on every street, grimacing, terrifying remains of people, frozen in the throes of death. Fear, sticky like cobwebs, penetrated the very depths of the soul, disorienting and hindering even thought. They burned it down. Everything that could burn blazed until dawn, and the souls of the slain people, captured by the cursed High Witch, now freed from their bonds, soared up in the purifying flames. But that wasn't the scariest part. The indifference, the driven and hopeless looks on the weathered faces of his team's fighters, that was truly terrifying. Even those accustomed to seeing death in its most unappealing guises couldn't bear the sight of a dead city, destroyed at the whim of one of the dark witches. His apprentice, who had stared blankly at the road passing under the horse's hooves the whole way back, had become silent and withdrawn. The fabric of the world was tearing. Everyone felt it. But could they do anything? Who was to blame for the souls writhing, rotting, and decaying inside still living people? Daniel's team. Only two of them remained. Three of their comrades were left lying there in the inhospitable thickets of the northern grove where ghouls and zombies had appeared, moving from desecrating graves and eating the dead to attacking living people in a nearby village. It seemed that dealing with mindless monsters should be simple but they couldn't have guessed that a fog werewolf was also there, ancient, fiercely guarding its territory. And it struck just when the men, exhausted from a prolonged battle with a whole nest of vile creatures, let their guard down. Daniel said Victor died instantly. The monster tore his head off with one motion. It didn't hesitate for a moment, jumped to Walter, he at least managed to draw his blade and disemboweled him. While the fair-haired bard tried to hold in his spilling guts, the werewolf slashed Jan's throat. He choked on his blood, convulsing. Daniel and Lewis, whom their comrades' deaths bought time, beheaded the creature. Then they dug graves for those with whom they had shared blood and bread, pain and victories for nine years. Now both sat in the farthest corner of the hall with unknown numbers of ale mugs, drowning their sorrow. They were hunters. They couldn't show weakness. 
not even in front of those on their side. But how to contain the howling grief that they couldn't save, couldn't protect, couldn't notice in time? Teams were falling apart, losing fighters, leaving a bloody trail behind them. And the monsters multiplied, coming from everywhere, appearing even where they had never been seen before. They broke into houses, though such a thing had never happened before. They destroyed entire villages, slaughtered small towns. The Holy Brotherhood did nothing. The cursed Inquisitors only knew how to spy on hunters, throw a wrench in the works, mock the pain of loss, preach sermons and light bonfires. And then a silent and later open war began. Henry, an experienced hunter, got to one of the monks in his rage and broke his neck. Their team had just lost two, and the holy man mockingly suggested that the seven gods were punishing the godless hunters. The scandal was hushed up, and a large sum of money collected by the hunters pacified the enraged Holy Brotherhood. Just a few days later, Nate's team clashed with three priests who ordered a village burned, confident that the plague afflicting the people could be eradicated this way. The hunters' claims that a dark witch was at work went unheeded until Nate brought her head, but the village was still set on fire. Fortunately, the healed villagers were unharmed. The three priests screamed and writhed in the fire, paying with their lives for their cruelty. Nate's team wasn't punished. Though everyone knew the truth, it couldn't be proven. The villagers unanimously claimed that the Dark Witch had bewitched the Inquisitors, and they jumped into the fire themselves. The tension grew, and now, by royal decree, garrisons were strengthened in every city with guild branches and holy order monasteries to avoid the impending disaster. Brave warriors, despite orders, often sided with the hunters, dealing with the priests cautiously and strictly on business. They dragged the brawlers apart without the slightest politeness. They could even throw them in prison to clear their heads. This cooled the zeal of the warring parties, but not for long. Skirmishes flared up here and there, provoked by both hunters and priests. Along with reports that monsters were emerging from their usual hunting grounds into cities and busy roads, this horrified the barons. Everything was heading toward a desperate abyss. Avon sighed and took a drink from his mug. Today they received a request. Two days' journey from the city, something unimaginable was happening. The graveyard inhabitants, zombies, lost their rest and set out to visit their living relatives. Underwater monsters dragged two women washing clothes from the docks into the depths. A group of young vampires appeared slightly west, always drawn to death and misery. A day's journey north, a mad vagrant was found in the elderberry thickets, his incoherent babbling leading the hunters to believe that a trading caravan had encountered a lizard werewolf. Yesterday, a completely insane woman burst into the guild, claiming she had seen Grimm, the giant black dog foreshadowing imminent death. She couldn't be calmed, and by morning the poor woman died of a heart attack. Experienced hunters never believed in ghostly harbingers, but among the apprentices, panic flared. To the Greenhorns, the cursed dog appeared in every shadow, significantly reducing their effectiveness as fighters. Though they were only apprentices, they could fight on par with an ordinary adult man. The hunter's training made itself known. Tension only increased, wrapping the guild in a heavy cloud, hindering clear thinking and heating the atmosphere to the limit. Avon knew what was happening in other cities only from messengers who constantly traveled from guild to guild, transmitting orders from Master Torin. Ravens with scrolls tied to their legs darted like black lightning between cities delivering news of new and new creatures appearing near the border between humans and the magical folk. Hunters were exhausted, barely standing on their feet, and rest was out of the question. Everyone became aggressive and nervous, 
jumping at any suspicious noise. So when the door to the guild's common hall suddenly flew open, crashing against the walls, the fighters leaped up, and in the dim light of the lamps, bare steel gleamed. Godwin? Avon squinted at the noisy guest in surprise and sheathed his sword with a rustle. Damn it, you can't just barge in like that. What if one of my guys had a crossbow? They'd have shot you without mercy. Not likely, the man sneered in his usual manner and decisively approached his guildmate. The hunters eyed Godwin with distrust. Such behavior was completely uncharacteristic of him. He never showed up in the common halls, rarely stayed overnight in the guild, and they could go months without knowing what was happening with him or where he was. Now he burst into the hall with such a racket that he could wake the dead. When Avon saw who followed Godwin, he couldn't believe his eyes. Robert? He said in shock and took a step back. But you? Yes, it's me in the flesh, interrupted a familiar voice, and the former hunter grinned, tilting his head as if listening. I'm not that easy to kill, Avon. I see... The dark-haired man nodded slowly. Master Torin. No, he doesn't know, Godwin muttered. And Avon felt a flash of irritation. Damned Hunter always brought trouble with him, as if doing others a favor. And so it was this time. The dark-haired guy walked forward without delay, stopping so he could see all the hunters present, and crossed his arms over his chest. Out of the corner of his eye, Avon noticed a short, skinny boy shyly clinging to Robert. Godwin had called him his apprentice, but it was clear the lad was inside the guild for the first time. Suspicions flared again at the sight of the hunter considered dead. Each of you feels that something is wrong, the hunter began without preamble, and all eyes turned to the man. The activity of monsters is growing, while the higher white witches and nature spirits are disappearing from our lands as if they are afraid of something. And we found out why. To the east, near the border, we discovered the abyss gates, within which a breach to the reverse side is forming. I think everyone understands what this means for us. A collective gasp swept through the hall. The fighters frowned and clenched their fists, feeling the suffocating fear of the future rise in their hardened souls. There will be several breaches, the hunter continued, his steel eyes gleaming. My task is to find out where and when, as well as locate the main gate, the so-called big rupture, and your task is to save as many as you can. Don't risk unnecessarily and don't send apprentices to their deaths. Lead people to the protections of large fortresses and prepare for defense. And also, notify as many hunters as possible. Let the teams return to the cities. These abyss gates didn't just appear, Avon noted thoughtfully squinting. Who's behind all this? Godwin hesitated. In just a few minutes, he had assessed the situation in the city and realized that the clashes between the priests and the hunters had taken on threatening proportions, so he didn't want to ignite even more hatred, considering the situation all human lands were in. And not just human lands. Judging by the behavior of nature spirits and white witches, the magical folk were also scared of what could happen, and they never panicked without a substantial reason. He glanced at the cowering Kale, pondering what to do. Hunters needed to know their enemy. The Holy Brotherhood, he answered shortly to Avon's lingering question. What? The astonished hunter barely suppressed the urge to clear his ear. This must stay within the guild, Godwin warned, noticing the dangerous glint in the hunter's eyes. If the common folk find out... A massacre could begin, where the innocent will suffer. I repeat, your task is to ensure safety. What we'll face is no game, and the scale of the disaster is not the usual skirmishes with the undead. It's us or them. Hunters were always people of action, 
so the hall emptied in moments. Collected, focused, the fighters left the guild's walls, knowing exactly what they were up against. Uncertainty, hopelessness, anxiety, and the feeling of inevitability vanished. They were determined. Strength returned, and the teams got to work. Admit it. You used spells, Robert asked quietly and distrustfully, not expecting such unquestioning compliance. Godwin grimaced and said nothing, confirming his friend's suspicions. Robert, Avon approached the former hunter. How did you survive? What do you want to hear from me? Robert asked irritably, shaking his head. How I lay dying for days, abandoned by everyone, knowing no one would look for me. How I cauterized my wounds myself, surviving like a wild animal. I heard it was a fog werewolf, the hunter said harshly. And it wounded you. So what? Robert bared his teeth, and this time his grin was unfriendly. In the flickering light, inhuman fangs gleamed. Don't play the fool. You know as well as I do what happens to those bitten by a werewolf. Why the blindfold? He's blind. The red-haired boy peeked out from behind the werewolf's back uncertainly. His eyes shone. The lad was scared, but he was full of determination to defend his friend. Avon! A heavy hand rested on his shoulder. The hunter turned and froze. Godwin stood right in front of him, and silver melted in his gray eyes. Enchantingly, captivatingly, and incredibly beautifully. Avon blinked and shook his head angrily. What the devil is going on here? He roared, shaking Godwin's hand off his shoulder. Robert is my friend and partner, the dark-haired man said coldly, slightly raising an eyebrow in surprise. And I vouch for him as I do for myself. Is that enough for you? Avon looked darkly at the frowning hunter and sighed heavily, waving his hand at him and his company. Where to now? he asked Godwin, trying not to look at Robert. To Torin, the man smiled. And then, I hope, we'll give those cursed inquisitors a hot evening. Don't let me miss the fun. Avon smiled against his will. We'll save some for you? The werewolf laughed and slapped his guildmate on the shoulder. Good luck, the hunter said unexpectedly for himself and hurried out of the common hall. Did you see? He shrugged off my spell, Godwin reported to Robert incredulously. What handsome, a blow to your ego? The werewolf smirked, and the hunter almost saw him squinting slyly. You're wearing the amulet that protects us from your hallucinations. Godwin gave them only two hours of rest. Kale understood they were extremely pressed for time, but he couldn't forgive the grumpy hunter. His back ached, his legs buckled, and his head rang like a tolling bell. As he dragged himself through the guild's corridors looking for a room, he cursed everything in the world, starting with Godwin, who had glanced at the novice, then waved vaguely toward the living quarters, advising him to find an empty room. The boy was too shy to barge into the first room he found, and he couldn't determine from the outside whether it was occupied or not. So he sadly wandered from wing to wing, not daring even to knock on the wooden doors. You've passed here four times already, came a quiet and annoyed voice from an opening door when Kale yawned so loudly that it seemed like a horde of ghosts had rushed by. Looking for a room, the boy muttered, turning around. In front of him, in nothing but his underclothes, stood the familiar lad, Eldwood. Kyle didn't recognize him immediately. A deep frown furrowed his forehead. The corners of his mouth were pulled down, and his lips were compressed into a thin line. His brown eyes seemed even darker with a familiar expression of anger and hopelessness. So why make a fuss? Eldwood asked, stepping into the corridor and carefully closing the door behind him. Go into any room. Just don't touch these four at the end. That's our team. 
The others left half an hour ago. His voice had become hollow, quite unlike the ringing, boyish tone that had sounded near the stables during their first meeting. Thanks, the novice said gratefully, but didn't hurry to leave. He saw that Eldwood was painfully shy, struggling with his fear and wanting to ask him something. Tell me, the dark-haired boy finally forced out. Who was that? My teacher didn't say. Kyle immediately understood what Eldwood was talking about. Everything that happened then had seeped into his memory like poison into blood, sometimes appearing in his nightmares, making him wake up with a pounding heart and glance at Godwin. The spider vampirus, he answered, looking at the boy from under his brow. Godwin said she was a high dark witch. How could she do that? Eldwood asked quietly, more to himself, swallowing nervously. Kale understood him. He remembered his own helplessness when his body stopped obeying, and his consciousness plunged into darkness, the terror for the reckless hunter who rushed to protect his apprentice. He remembered the desperate tears on his face as a fragile life slipped away under his hands, and only the wind lashed his face as Godwin's horse flew across the ground in an attempt to save him. And Eldwood was now desperately afraid. What he had to see, such a young being, no one should see. Death, spreading its arms over an entire city, settling in every corner. If seasoned hunters couldn't bear it, what about a young boy, impressionable and dreaming of feats and heroic battles, glory and admiration, boasting in the backyard to others like him about his first independently killed creature, which, in his understanding, embodied only malice and pain. His world was inexorably collapsing under the pressure of harsh reality, threatening to crush his young soul, to mutilate, to turn into pitiful remnants of a human being. These creatures are completely different from humans, a familiar voice suddenly said quietly. Behind them stood Godwin. The expression on his face was unreadable, but Kyle caught one emotion in the steel eyes. Sympathy. Don't try to measure them by humanity, he addressed the frozen Eldwood. They have no soul, no pity, no sense of right and wrong. She thought she was doing people a favor, creating another better life for them. If you want to become a real hunter, you must learn to separate your feelings, to isolate your consciousness from what you see, and judge what happened only practically. Your head must always be cool and clear. My teacher says the same, Eldwood replied quietly, not taking his eyes off the hunter. His dark eyes were a mix of caution and poorly hidden admiration. Right, Godwin nodded approvingly. Now go. You have a tough day tomorrow. The boy turned quickly but spoke again when he opened the door. Will we manage? His voice trembled involuntarily. Can we drive these monsters back? Of course. Godwin unexpectedly smiled warmly and brightly, and Kale froze in amazement. The dull pain and longing which had been evident in every movement of Eldwood vanished as if the sun had erased the shadow from the earth. The boy smiled back, relieved, confident, and happy, and disappeared into his room. And why are you gaping? Godwin asked unfriendly, and the novice immediately wanted to strangle him on the spot. I said two hours to rest, so I suggest you decide on a room and go to sleep. If not, I'll send you packing. Kyle suppressed the urge to roll his eyes, muttered something obscene, and hid in the nearest room. Godwin snorted, went downstairs, where Robert was packing supplies. How are you going to cover in a day what takes more than a week? The werewolf asked gloomily. High witches have their own paths, the hunter replied. Two hours later, Godwin made good on his threat. He burst into Kyle's room, ripped off the blanket, and threw him to the floor. 
the disheveled boy began cursing the hunter who just snorted and left. Going downstairs, Kyle cursed at the hunter and thought about torturing him, and Robert, seeing him, just laughed cheerfully. Enjoying yourselves? Godwin asked as he approached. Get ready. We'll ride a bit further from the town, then take the secret path, he said. The secret path? Where is that? Kale asked. You'll see, the hunter replied, throwing him a bag. After riding the necessary distance, Godwin gave instructions. No steps without him, stick together, and don't let the creatures smell blood. Then the hunter slashed his wrist, and the world around them changed. They found themselves in an endless step with a beautiful sky. Robert, stunned, looked at the inverted constellations. Godwin explained that magic weakens here, and he himself had turned into a witcher. Kyle, staring intently, was struck by his appearance. Everything is not what it seems here, Godwin said. Don't relax. It may seem perfect at first glance, but when some creature devours you, we'll see how you sing. What is this place? Robert asked after a while, occasionally glancing at the boy. He behaved calmly, turning his head, often lingering on Godwin's appearance. These are the paths of high witches, the hunter replied briefly. It's hard to survive here. A high witch or witcher is a natural-born fighter, so the path is relatively safe for them. Many human mages who dared to use these paths didn't last here even five minutes. We've been here quite a while, Robert yawned, and I don't see anything dangerous. That's the problem, the witcher squinted his silver eyes. But they see you perfectly. The werewolf shuddered and looked around, trying to identify the source of danger. Now that all his senses were on edge, he managed to notice the swift shadows gliding some distance from them. Who are they? He asked quietly, signaling Kale to stay closer. The novice didn't understand, but obediently came closer. Monsters, Godwin shrugged. What? Kale exclaimed. But I've seen them. They look completely different. We're walking on the edge of our world, Godwin explained, touching the hilt of his sword. One of the shadows, which had come closer than necessary, recoiled and joined the others, widening the distance. When they pass through our boundary, they change, take form, and appear to us as monsters. Here they are what they really are, bodiless entities, vengeful and greedy for other lives. Then why don't they attack? Robert asked quietly, his pupil contracting into a vertical slit as he tried to see the enemies following them. They sense me, the high witch shrugged calmly. Robert glanced at his friend but remained silent. They had been moving for three hours. The shadows still slid behind them, neither approaching nor falling behind. And after a while, Kale stopped noticing them, fully immersed in the surrounding landscape. He felt like there was a quiet, barely audible music around. Clear, enchanting, and incredibly beautiful. His eyelids grew heavy, his limbs numb, and the boy began to drift into sleep. The next thing he remembered was a dull thud against the ground. All the air was knocked out of his lungs. Black dots danced before his eyes. His horse reared and threw the rider off, frightened by the attacking creatures. He was yanked up by the scruff, set on his feet, and pushed behind. Robert had already transformed. Predatory yellow eyes glinted with a thirst for battle, and Godwin's sword shone with eager silver in the light of two moons. Damn it, bastards! The hunter hissed, crouching and tensing his legs. Robert Kale, see that shimmer over there? Go there with the horses. I'll hold them off. The novice, still trying to catch his breath after the fall and scare, looked in the indicated direction. Just a few yards from them, the air shimmered and rippled like a disturbed river surface. 
Robert frowned and opened his mouth to object but met Godwin's threatening gaze and backed down. He grabbed Kale's hand, practically shoved him onto the chestnut horse, seamlessly mounted his own steed, and urged it into a gallop towards the shimmering passage. Perfect! Godwin watched them go and glanced at his horse. The black horse snorted and bared impressive fangs at the approaching creatures of the path. Some time later, Godwin emerged from the passage disheveled, with a torn shirt, a snorting horse, singed hair, and a perfectly clean blade. He stopped, looked at his friends, smiled mischievously, and ran his hand through his hair. As always, Robert grimaced, feeling the nervous tremor leave him only when he saw the hunter alive and unharmed. You love making dramatic entrances, Godwin. The man heard his words, grinned mockingly, and bowed theatrically. Kale watched all this, rubbed his bruised side, and loudly complained to all the seven gods, rolling his eyes. At the gates of Eldora, there was the usual crush. Noise, hubbub, and incessant swearing quickly gave him a headache. Godwin frowned and tried to avoid accidental touches from people who nervously stepped aside when they saw the guild signs. But the crowd closed behind their backs, and the bickering, resembling dogfights, resumed with renewed vigor. Robert grimaced irritably, hissing and spitting. The werewolf's beastly nature demanded immediate order, to scatter the foul-smelling crowd and spill the blood of particularly noisy representatives of the human race. Kale saw that when Godwin understood the reason for the latest delay at the entrance, his nostrils flared like those of a hound, and he thought with dismay that only a lasso could hold him now. Godwin's black horse snorted and pushed towards the gate, where along with the guards a familiar robed figure was inspecting the arrivals. But Godwin's keen eye didn't miss how the unfamiliar priest held himself. He stood slightly apart and only pretended to carefully observe those entering the city, ostentatiously clutching a signal amulet in his hand. But his gaze was somewhat unfocused, as if the cleric knew exactly who he was looking for. The hunter squinted and exhaled angrily. On the priest's right hand, hidden by the white robe's sleeve, a light green tattoo briefly appeared, curling into an intricate pattern, the distinguishing mark not of an ordinary brother, but of a master. And Godwin already knew who the senior cleric was looking for. The hunter clenched his fingers and cast a spell, cancelling all the Inquisitor's enchantments and rendering the cleric completely powerless. The master could no longer use his power and had to rely solely on his skill with despised steel. However, the High Witcher, who had so quickly unmasked the unsuspecting enemy, was sure the cleric was no match for him. Robert, following his friend, felt that nothing good was coming. And so it was. Guarding the flock's peace, Holy Father? Godwin asked, approaching the gates and pushing aside a merchant who was just being inspected. So it is, the priest replied with dignity, glancing at Godwin and a carefully hidden recognition flickered across his face. The man was still in his prime. Broad shoulders and calloused hands suited a warrior more than a cleric. Dark eyes under furrowed brows looked keenly and appraisingly. And how are things going? Godwin almost hissed. The priest realized something was wrong too late. Only when he tried to draw power to confuse the hunted renegade with a spell in an instant. The hunter, without even dismounting, kicked the man in the face with the steel-toed tip of his boot. The crunch that followed the blow made Kale wince and pull his head into his shoulders. The priest grunted and raised his hands to his face, clutching his broken nose. Ignoring the frightened screams and the guards who backed away, no one wanted to get caught between a hammer and an anvil. Godwin grabbed the man by the collar and dragged him toward the guild without a word. Word of what happened at the gates reached Master Torin before the notorious trio, who had committed an act of vandalism against a representative of the Holy Order, appeared. 
So when Godwin, Robert, and Kale entered the Hunter's Guild gates, the enraged master was already waiting for them, and his expression made it clear that the graveyard next to the guild would have at least one more grave today. Godwin, however, looked fearlessly at the master's rage-twisted face and kicked the servant of the seven gods at the feet of the recoiling leader. What is the meaning of this? Torin bellowed, staggering back. Godwin, have you completely lost your mind? I'm perfectly sane, the man declared calmly, shaking his head. But I'm about to have a serious conversation with the Order, and I'll start with him. He prodded the whimpering priest with his boot. What are you doing? The victim of the abuse finally found his voice. We're about to talk about that. Godwin's face changed instantly. Cursing and invoking the devil, the hunter grabbed the priest by the scruff and dragged him into the master's office. Torin, shaking his fists and cursing the willful and clearly mad man, rushed after him. That's what happens when Godwin's enraged, Robert said, raising a finger instructively as the shocked hunters stared at him. Kale sighed heavily and trudged after Robert, who resolutely followed his friend into the guild building. The master was ready to tear his best hunter apart with his bare hands. It didn't matter that this guy could take down mighty monsters single-handedly, for which they usually had to send two or three teams. But this time, in his hatred for the Holy Order, this madman had crossed all boundaries. The guild wouldn't get away with this easily, and Godwin even less so. Don't look at me like I'm insane. The hunter snapped at Torin's silent insinuations. Did I complete the mission? Yes. Don't like the results? Not my problem. He shoved his prisoner forward into the guildmaster's office so hard the man couldn't stay on his feet and sprawled on the floor. The priest was incredibly strong and an experienced warrior. But against this hunter, he found himself unable to do anything. The hunter mercilessly thwarted all attempts to break free, and his grip was like a bear's, firm, steel-like, as if the seemingly fragile young man was woven from iron rods. What did you find? Torin sighed heavily, trying not to look at the priest struggling to rise from his knees and walk to his desk. Artificially created abyss gates using foul magic, Godwin replied, tilting his head observing the reaction of the old warrior. Our mutual acquaintance from the Holy Brotherhood, who's now trying to hide behind Robert, won't let me lie. The master flinched, barely suppressing the urge to gasp out loud. He only cursed so obscenely that Kale blushed. The priest froze, forgetting his pain. So this is who the Hunter's Guild had sent. The situation couldn't be worse. Recently, the Holy Order had drawn the wrath of both the common people and the upper echelons of power. But according to Archbishop Lucarius, who claimed to have a connection with the seven gods, the balance of power in this world was soon to change. They hadn't foreseen that one stubborn hunter would escape the trap alive, meaning their plans were now at risk. Inquisitor, there's no need to hide from me. I see everything. Godwin said mockingly, leaning toward the priest, frozen in an awkward position on the floor. Tell us something interesting. For instance, who created these gates inscribed the summoning magic and for what purpose? The priest bared his teeth in a bloody grin. If you didn't know all this, you wouldn't have attacked me at the gate, would you? He retorted, spitting at the master's feet. Torin glanced darkly at the spit and frowned. Right, Godwin said, and Torin stared dumbfounded at the hunter. The intonations in his voice didn't match his usual demeanor. A low, deep voice, mesmerizing and sending shivers down one's spine. The priest froze, entranced, not taking his eyes off Godwin. Robert felt disgusted. He understood that his friend was using his nature to make the prisoner talk, but he couldn't quell his body's reaction which definitely didn't like the way the priest looked at the man. A beast stirred inside him, 
lifting its head irritably. A growl rumbled in his throat. Kyle noticed Robert's tension and, following a fleeting impulse, touched his hand. The werewolf flinched, recoiled, but strangely, almost immediately calmed down, as if the novice's touch brought him back to reality. The red-haired boy sighed heavily. Now he knew why some people, and non-humans too, behaved so strangely in Godwin's presence. What he had seen on the secret path of the High Witches defied logical explanation or simple human language. However, he discovered a strange resistance to Godwin's charms. Thus, the novice was the only one in the room who kept a clear mind after the Witcher used his charm. So who ordered the placement of the small and large abyss gates? The hunter asked the priest. The Inquisitor flinched and looked at Godwin with admiration. But when the hunter tightened his steel grip, the priest howled in pain. Godwin always knew the weak spots of any creature. Robert gritted his teeth, not noticing Torin's suspicious and appraising glance. It seemed the master was less interested in the interrogation and more in scrutinizing the blind man who had returned from the dead. The werewolf had completely forgotten he needed to act like a wounded hunter. And the guildmaster saw this inconsistency, just as he saw Robert's slightly sharpened teeth. Archbishop Lucarius, the priest said, cringing from the pain in his dislocated joint. How many of these gates are there? Godwin frowned. Five, the Inquisitor whined in pain. Torin, distracted, looked at the grim hunter in horror. We must report this to the king, he said quietly. I'll send a bird with a warning. We need to mobilize the troops. Hunters can't handle all this alone. The seven gods will punish you, the priest spat. It is their will, and you, miserable mortals, cannot go against the gods. The archbishop is executing their will. Kale saw Godwin squint thoughtfully, as if trying to understand something. Then he stretched his lips in a grim smile and struck the Inquisitor hard. The man fell to the floor unconscious. The rest is up to you. You can even kill him, the hunter said disdainfully, wiping his hands with a cloth. Meanwhile, we'll go to the library. Despite the general fear of the situation, Kale smiled involuntarily. He loved books, and getting his hands on the hunter's archives, which contained mentions of all the monsters the fighters had ever encountered, was a dream come true. Awakened a thirst for knowledge? Torin raised his eyebrows in surprise as he unfolded a clean sheet of parchment. Sometimes I doubt your ability to think clearly, Godwin sneered. I want to look for any information on the creatures from the abyss gates. Why? Could there be something you don't know about monsters? Torin asked in surprise. Anyone else who dared speak to him in such a tone would have received a slap and been thrown out in disgrace, but not with this hunter. Much more was allowed to him than to everyone else. To us, they're completely unknown beings, Godwin responded unexpectedly seriously and nodded to Robert to go to the door. The werewolf mockingly saluted the guildmaster and slipped silently out of the office. Wait, Torin commanded, stopping Godwin from following his friend. The hunter looked back in bewilderment. What happened? The master demanded, and the man immediately understood who he was talking about. It doesn't matter, he said, his voice barely showing a threatening tone. He's alive, and that's all that matters to me. But it matters to me, the master unexpectedly stated firmly. He fought a werewolf. Even if he survived, the werewolf must have bitten him. And that means only one thing, Godwin. The hunter moved so swiftly that the master couldn't have followed him even if he wanted to. He's here under my responsibility and I swear he won't harm anyone. But if you or anyone else tries even to look at him sideways, Godwin hissed like an enraged predator. 
A beastly growl rolled threateningly in his low voice, and the master felt his heart race in terror. You'll have to deal with me, and I won't care that you're weaker, Torin. This is just a warning. Don't make it a reality. And he stormed out of the office, slamming the door loudly behind him. The guildmaster stood for a few more moments, trying to calm his racing thoughts and his pounding heart. This madman had dragged a werewolf into the Hunter's Guild, albeit one not fully turned, quarreled with the Holy Order, against which no charges had yet been brought, though the Master had no doubt the King would side with the Guild. What would this rascal do next? Should he issue a decree banning him from entering Guild buildings? Torin sighed, glanced disapprovingly at the unconscious body in the middle of his office, and couldn't resist a vindictive kick to its side. Not too hard, but the satisfaction from doing what he had wanted to do since the priests began to ruin the hunter's lives spread through his body in a wave. The master smiled and sat down with a clear conscience to write a report on the emergency to the king. Sometime later. The candle's flame flickered slightly in the almost still air, then danced wildly, almost going out, when the broad-shouldered man with beastly eyes sniffed the air, gripped the oak table, and then sneezed loudly, sending ancient dust, probably from the library's creation, swirling upwards. Damn you, Robert, Godwin said, his nose in a book, jumping up and knocking over a stack of manuscripts with a crash. The room filled with a dusty haze, punctuated by stifled curses, snorting, and harsh coughing. I hate digging through these papers, the werewolf declared, looking up at the ceiling. Kale glanced at him disapprovingly, cautiously turned a yellowed page and squinted. His eyes were tired from long reading by candlelight, but the hunter had said their task was urgent, so they had to find all possible information as quickly as possible. Despite his fatigue, the novice diligently searched for any mention of the strange creatures that had appeared in their world. Why couldn't we face a threat from beautiful nymphs? Robert asked wistfully, his eyes narrowing blissfully. Judging by his predatory grin, his imagination was occupied with far from virtuous fantasies. Maybe you should go to town? Take a break? Godwin suggested slyly, raising his hand. A scroll rolled up and thrown by the werewolf's firm hand, landed on the floor with a slap. Are you kidding? Robert snorted, not at all upset that his projectile hadn't hit its target. Kale almost choked on his indignant cry, watching the barbaric treatment of ancient scrolls by the fate-brought company. The next two hours passed in silence, occasionally broken by Robert's terrifying howls and clicking as he fought sleep but lost hopelessly. His eyes stuck together, and the nights when his beastly nature gave him no rest weighed heavily on his shoulders with fatigue. Kyle's shout of, I found it, made him jump, grabbing for the hilt of a non-existent blade. Kid, he said indignantly to the novice, who blushed at such an unflattering nickname, you can't scare old people like that. Whatever you say, old man, Kale replied. And now the werewolf frowned, hearing Godwin's chuckle from the corner. Come on, show me what you found, he grumbled, grabbed his candle and moved it closer to the boy. The red-haired head bent over an ancient thick folio in a leather binding with gold embossing. In the beginning there was only chaos. Dark, impenetrable, gaping with the maw of emptiness and the sharp teeth of those hiding in the swirling mists. Invisible, intangible, but infinitely terrifying in their madness. Calm and benevolent, full of awareness of the power and force swirling in their bodiless souls. Then everything changed. It collapsed in an instant. Time streams pierced the pliant flesh of nothingness like rays, flaring up like the sun, and the center of reason appeared. The Book of Fate unique in all realities. Writing itself, controlled by no one except the Chosen. 
and the entities found themselves trapped in a cage between the borders of emerging and developing worlds. A deep anger seized the immortal beings. Madness spilled out in hatred for all living things. They were called the Others. As soon as the thin walls of their prison weakened, they burst out with a howl, bringing disaster to the world where chaos had broken through. The Keeper was an unrelenting and mighty guardian, protecting the backsides of the worlds. Armed with the power of all worlds, the wisdom gathered in the single mysterious library. He opposed the terrible mad creatures that, driven by rage, rushed to where small sparks of life flickered. And in the worlds were his envoys, watching the others, not allowing them to penetrate vulnerable realities. And if disaster struck, they summoned the Keeper, defeated the void creatures and drove them back to the interworld. The Stronghold of the World of Aberon, the Holy Abbey. It stands like an unbreakable rock, holding back hostile entities, for the power hidden within its walls is accessible to only a few. They are called the Seven, and their power is boundless within this world. If the monsters are somewhat understandable, what's the mention of the Seven Gods about? I don't get it. Robert frowned. They are the viceroys of the Guardian, Kale explained. But Godwin saw confusion in his eyes. And if disaster strikes, they must summon him to deal with the trouble. But that priest spoke of the exact opposite. The seven gods ordered the monsters into our world. The novice fell silent, completely confused. Godwin stood, leaning on the table, and disjointed images began to flash in his memory. There was something painfully familiar in all of this. Maybe we should ask someone in the know about all this? The hunter pushed away from the table and brushed off his hands. Let's pay a courtesy visit to Archbishop Lucarius. Torin will be furious, Robert noted, but didn't protest. When the king officially approves the dissolution of the Holy Brotherhood, we'll get nothing. All the culprits will be sent to the dungeons of the residence. Godwin squinted and snapped his fingers. And we'll just talk to him now. Kyle sighed heavily and shook his head. His shoulders ached from constantly sitting in the same position, which was quite traumatic for the spine. He had no doubts that after Godwin's conversation, the Archbishop would be missing a few dozen teeth. They were on the secret path again. And once again, Kale observed the enchanting scenery of an entirely otherworldly nature. But now it was slightly different from just a few hours ago. Gray clouds, like patches of dirt, appeared on the velvet sky. Lifeless, steel, like cuts in the perfect cover of the night. Godwin didn't like this at all. Kale saw him beckon Robert. He said something quietly, gesturing, and the werewolf nodded understandingly. Turning his back to the novice, he lowered his head, and a wave of transformation passed through his body heavy and apparently painful. The yellow eyes gleamed in the unusual light of the path, and the stiff fur seemed to turn silver, illuminated by the rays of the two moons. It must be said that in his combat form Robert looked terrifying. A primal fear gripped the soul at one glance into his monstrous, otherworldly and inhuman eyes, now full of barely contained glee. The beast had finally gained almost complete freedom and was now relishing the fresh air. Kale didn't have to wonder long why Godwin asked Robert to take on the werewolf form. There was no time for questions when monsters blocked the path of the three desperate travelers. If last time they had skulked in the shadows, cautiously, but persistently sniffing the air, this time these creatures clearly felt empowered or perhaps there were many more of them. Already within fifteen minutes on the path, they decided to attack. And then Kale saw Godwin's magic in action for the first time. He had never imagined magic to be so... insanely beautiful. 
a colorful whirl of spell threads wrapped tightly around the hunter's slender figure, and Godwin attacked not only with the silver steel gleaming in the moonlight, which shimmered and hissed as if alive. The deadly threads caught enemies in snares like flexible whips, tore flesh with a ringing, and flared up in frenzied fiery whirlwinds, surrounding the hunter with a flaming shield. And next to him fought Robert in werewolf form, swift, just as dangerous as the creatures they fought. The movements of his clawed paws were hard to follow, and a predatory grin played on his metamorphosed lips. In his golden eyes burned a feral fury and delight in the battle, the scent of flowing blood, the clear fear of monsters who hadn't expected to meet such formidable opponents. Kale tried to stay away from the battle, but the enemies constantly shifted, forcing Godwin and Robert to move. And despite the hunter's efforts to keep the novice from being defenseless against creatures he couldn't handle, he got distracted, pulling Robert out of a mess the werewolf had fallen into by not noticing an enemy sneaking up from behind. When a terrifying, snarling face with venomous green eyes and vertical pupils appeared in front of the boy, he froze, feeling the breath of death inches away, unable to move, paralyzed by fear. His breath caught, a lump formed in his throat, and his legs refused to obey. Kale was rooted to the ground, feeling only the thin streams of painful cold seeping down his neck. The creature suddenly stopped, sniffed the air in confusion, as if not quite understanding whether it faced friend or foe. However, Kyle doubted these beings had any concept of friendship. More likely they understood belonging to the pack. One of us. And for some incomprehensible reason, the enemy hesitated. Perhaps this doubt gave the boy enough courage to draw the dagger Godwin had given him from his belt and without a moment's hesitation, thrust it into the most vulnerable spot of the monster, in its eye. The opponent roared, shaking its head violently, then pressed it to the ground, trying to rid itself of the stinging blade stuck in its horned socket, suddenly wheezed and fell on its side, revealing a smoking wound on its belly, from which black blood pulsed out. Are you alive? Are you okay? Godwin glanced at the novice, looked at his shaking hands, grinned, and unexpectedly winked encouragingly. Kale only nodded, backing away and not even trying to control his trembling until he pressed against the hot side of the black horse. The monsters, tails between their legs, retreated. But the novice still felt the intense gaze on him. The enemies hadn't left them alone, just temporarily retreated. Godwin made an imperceptible movement with his sword, and dark, thick drops of blood rolled off in beads onto the grass, leaving the blade pristine. The hunter calmly sheathed his weapon, shook his tired wrists, and leaped onto his horse. The wind spirit bared impressive fangs, glancing disapprovingly at the transformed Robert, and lunged forward, not waiting for his master's slow companions to follow. The wind whipped his face. The fast ride and sharp sense of danger intoxicated his blood. Kale hadn't noticed this in himself before. He liked the quiet peace of the library, safe, where the rustle of pages sounded like a battle horn, the barely audible creak of leather binding, clashing blades and the crackle of a candle's flame, the roar of fires of creating history. But it had never threatened him with death which today breathed its soul-chilling cold on him. And, against common sense, Kale didn't regret getting involved in this. It made him feel alive, but most importantly, needed, necessary. Although he still didn't understand why two such warriors as Robert and Godwin, who were no longer human, dragged him along, it undoubtedly flattered him. Moreover, deep in his mind, there was a fear that one day they would decide to get rid of such a clumsy person as he was. Monsters cautiously trailed at a respectful distance, not approaching but not falling behind. 
Sometimes Kale thought there were more of them, but as soon as he blinked, the creatures would dissolve into the eternal night of the path again, and only a keen sense of danger reminded him that the pursuers were very close. Godwin was quite calm. It seemed the monsters had understood that the prey wasn't easy, and they didn't want to face biting steel and stinging spells. He understood this well. They reached the exit of the path without incident, accompanied by the mournful howl of the creatures, and emerged into the ordinary world. They were a few yards from the massive wall surrounding the citadel of the Holy Brotherhood. Stone walls rising high, a deep moat circling the ancient, still formidable and impregnable structure. Sharp spires of towers pierced the gloomy skies, gnawing into the gray steel sky like hungry beasts. A drawbridge led to the gates, guarded diligently by stern senior brothers. This post, contrary to logic, was honorable. They sent only those whose strength and loyalty were unquestionable. Kale had been here only once. When, as a very young boy, he was brought here after his hometown was engulfed by the cleansing flames of the seven gods, and he remembered not what he saw now. Gloomy corridors, an oppressive sense of something wrong, hostile, dangerous. How do you plan to get in there? Robert asked skeptically, eyeing the lowered bridge and the two broad-shouldered brothers armed with halberds. In the hands of city guards, such weapons always looked somewhat inappropriate, partly because the representatives of authority didn't really know how to use them, except to club like batons. The senior brothers guarding the entrance held them with a certain negligence, but at the same time with a special grip that distinguished true experts from clumsy ones. And Robert had no doubt they handled these cumbersome weapons well. Very simply, Godwin grinned and took off the saddlebag. He loosened the ties and carelessly shook out three robes with crossed torches on the back onto the grass. Kale glanced at the hunter as if he were insane. Did Godwin really think they'd just be let into the Holy of Holies just because they wore the robes of the Holy Brotherhood? He voiced his thoughts fully. Not us, the hunter clarified, but you. And we are just escorts. Anyway... I see no other option. Kale drilled a hole in the cheeky dark-haired man with his eyes, who, without the slightest embarrassment, pulled the robe over his clothes and gently stroked the black horse's soft muzzle. The novice sighed, shaking his red head, and reached for his cassock. When they approached the gates, he was already visibly trembling with fear that they would fail. No matter how strong Godwin and Robert were, they couldn't stand against so many brothers, many of whom possessed powers dangerous to the High Witcher. The guards gave them lazy glances, ran their eyes over the silent hunter, darted to the unruffled Robert, and immediately tensed, unmistakably sensing warriors in them. May the seven gods light your paths, brothers, Kale greeted them, trying to hide the trembling in his knees. May the light remain in your hands, one of the guards responded cautiously, turning his sharp eyes to the novice. He looked closer, and recognition flickered in his eyes. The red-headed book lover, the second one smiled broadly, and both visibly relaxed. Kale sighed heavily. What's your business here? Master Michael sent a bird to Archbishop Lucarius about my arrival with a report on the hunter's case the novice said without faltering, bowing his head at the mention of his mentor. And who are they? One of the brothers asked suspiciously, eyeing the novice's companions. However, he asked more out of formality. I had some conflict with the hunters, Kale confided. You know, brother, how uncultured and hot-tempered they are. In short, barbarians. So now I need... protection... The guards exchanged glances and laughed, nodding approvingly. Behind him he heard hissing sounds, and the novice could swear Robert was holding back a very angry Godwin. Feeling the hunter's piercing gaze on his back, Kale stepped onto the drawbridge with dignity. 
The first obstacle was successfully overcome. When they entered the courtyard, it became clear. If you entered the citadel, you were worthy, and no one would monitor your actions. To Robert's biased view, the Holy Brothers were overly complacent in their confidence that no force could rival the Holy Order. Godwin seemed to share the same opinion. As soon as they turned the corner, he grimaced and waved his hands, releasing a colorful spray of a sleep spell from his fingers. Complex, extensive, and incredibly intricate in its web of threads. It was both amusing and terrifying to watch the proud brothers, who had been strutting around the courtyard like peacocks just moments earlier, collapse to the ground. Kyle glanced at the pale witcher, who was clutching his temples and shook his head. There was no other safe way to get to the archbishop's quarters. The best of the brotherhood, the seven-headed hounds, guarded him day and night. They might not have immediately seen through Godwin, but they would have immediately recognized Robert as a werewolf, even with the simple disguise spells Godwin had cast on him. The whole plan would have gone down the drain. Narrow corridors gave way to wide ones, spacious enough for a cart to pass through, and then to vast halls. Everywhere was marked by strict asceticism, nothing superfluous, only what allowed mere existence. Godwin, who had led a reckless and utterly immodest life in his time as a witcher, only grimaced with an earnest question in his eyes. Why do people voluntarily condemn themselves to this? Robert, less restrained, growled and irritably kicked the doors. The doors groaned and sent curses after the vandals in a language known only to them. Kale, used to such surroundings, barely noticed them. He was more concerned with a far more important task. How to find the one room they needed in this maze of corridors. After half an hour of wandering, which led nowhere, and with Robert getting the impression they were walking in circles, the corridors were that identical. Godwin decisively stopped over a sweetly snoring brother and unceremoniously hoisted him up by the collar. Could you point us to the archbishop's quarters? He grinned, waving his open palm in front of his latest victim's face. Kael saw the sleep threads cocooning the priest fade away, and he blinked in astonishment before pointing in the right direction, his eyes sliding over the strange character's robes. Well done, Godwin patted him on the shoulder. The brother collapsed back to the stone floor, squirmed to get comfortable, and began to snore twice as loudly. If they hadn't been shown this barely noticeable branch of the corridor, they likely would have missed it. The narrow stone passage led them to a steep spiral staircase consisting of seventy flights. Kale counted, clutching his side, which was mercilessly stabbing, his breath coming in gasps. He reluctantly admitted that if it weren't for the exhausting training sessions Godwin imposed on the whining novice, he wouldn't have made it halfway collapsing limply on the steps. The door was entirely unremarkable, a simple wooden panel with a metal handle. But when Robert reached to open it, Godwin quickly intercepted his hand. It's enchanted. He squinted as if seeing something through a layer of water. And very unusual. The weaving reminds me most of the magic of the High Witches, but there are some strange threads, completely uncharacteristic of our world. Can you break the protection? The werewolf leaned casually against the wall, but his gleaming eyes revealed his concern. Already done, Godwin nodded at the door. Be ready. The well-oiled hinges turned soundlessly, allowing the three uninvited guests into a small room. Unlike what they had seen downstairs, here reigned an atmosphere of relaxation. A thick carpet covered the floor. Heavy curtains blocked the sunlight from the windows, several heavy candelabras with lit candles, and a massive desk cluttered with papers, scrolls, and books. You took your time, the man sitting behind the desk said mockingly, lifting his head. Got lost in the citadel? He looked no more than fifty, 
but the network of wrinkles and dull, lifeless eyes told otherwise. He was quite corpulent and sluggish. Perhaps in his distant youth he had been a renowned warrior, but now he was merely a shadow of his former self. Robert could assert with absolute certainty that there was no one else in the room. The beast inside him stirred restlessly and bared its impressive fangs only in the direction of the imperturbable and mocking archbishop. My men weren't wrong about you, Godwin, the man nodded approvingly to the frozen hunter. Enchanter, cleverly put everyone to sleep here. But this room, he patted the table with satisfaction, is protected from the likes of you and your friend. Robert snorted, trying to sound as dismissive as possible. However, Lucarius only glanced in his direction, making it clear he saw through the werewolf. He also knew that Robert was beginning to shake. Something was clearly provoking his animal nature, making it increasingly difficult to control. Witcher. The Archbishop leaned back in his chair, using the unexpected reception's confusion to his advantage. I've heard so much about you. I've even met some. Our conversations were usually brief, but even they gave me an understanding of your nature. At first... I couldn't understand why the seven gods endowed the magical folk with such powers. Powers incomprehensible to ordinary people, creating such attractive forms for you. As if trying to demonstrate your superiority over us. Then I realized, despite all your virtues, you lack what we have. A soul and eternal life after death. Isn't that right, Godwin? Tell me, am I right? Godwin watched the motionless archbishop with narrowed eyes as if trying to see something. Then he smirked and shrugged. Look at your friend, Lucarius leaned forward. See how the darkness inside him is trying to break free. How long do you think he can hold it back? I'm afraid not long. This room is woven with spells that reveal true natures. It brings out the worst in you. Through such work I've learned something. You are an abomination to this world, like a festering sore on its body. And sores are treated simply. They are cauterized, eradicated to the root. That's what will happen to you. Kale watched the tense werewolf anxiously. Robert indeed behaved oddly. His muscles were tense, hardened as if in spasm, and his eyes darted aimlessly from corner to corner, never lingering on anything for even a moment. He now resembled a beast desperately trying to break free from a cage, and his gaze was purely animal, mad with a thirst for freedom. But the archbishop's appearance irritated him. It seemed his eyes were tearing up, the outlines of his corpulent figure blurred, and then Kael's peripheral vision caught something foreign, standing right behind Lucarius. An ethereal shadow almost invisible if not for the danger emanating from it and the oppressive pressure on the mind. Kale instinctively backed away, not taking his eyes off the dark, shapeless figure. Godwin quickly glanced at him, intercepted the frightened look, and frowned. The boy usually didn't panic without reason, which was his undeniable merit. But to see what the novice was clearly seeing, Godwin would have to deactivate his amulet and that could lead to entirely unpredictable consequences. The archbishop, continuing his mockingly heartfelt speech, didn't immediately realize his listeners had long been distracted by something else, and he grew indignant. You will not leave here alive, he roared, making the red-haired boy jump. We'll see about that, Godwin said, not taking his eyes off the werewolf who was clearly getting worse. Maybe you'll introduce us to those who give such interesting orders and say nothing about the consequences for the whole world. I thought you had figured it out long ago, Witcher. Lucarius huffed in disappointment. The seven gods are merely my guiding star. They chose me as their earthly representative. They guide my hand and I serve only them. So you claim to receive orders from the gods themselves? 
Godwin raised his eyebrows in surprise. The archbishop nodded. It was indeed the light on the path he had chosen. The gods appeared to him in dreams, predicting events yet to happen, giving instructions, guiding him on the true path. And he served them as he believed, without a shadow of doubt, fervently and passionately. Godwin finally decided and touched the amulet, deactivating the protection. As soon as he did, the shadow by the archbishop seemed to awaken from a deep sleep. It stirred, expanded, and suddenly lunged at them like a foggy cloud. Breathing became almost impossible. Kale started coughing, collapsing to his knees and clutching his throat. A ring of pain squeezed his head, throbbing and stinging worse than a scorpion's sting. And the priest, in ecstasy, jumped to his feet and threw the chair aside. They protect me. Their hand is stretched over all the fates of this world, and no one can resist their will. The dark entity howled triumphantly and lunged forward, flinging the sword-wielding Godwin against the wall with a forceful impact slapping the rising werewolf with a foggy tentacle, knocking him flat, and sliding towards the novice doubled over in sharp pain. But it couldn't harm him. It simply passed harmlessly through the boy's body, pausing in confusion. The boy even thought the formless creature momentarily took shape, sniffing the air, examining the unusual prey in bewilderment. Kale didn't think long. He grabbed Godwin's fallen sword and plunged the hissing moon steel into the frozen entity. The fog scattered in shreds, writhed in desperate agony, and howled with a hundred different voices. It soared up in a futile attempt to escape and dissipated into a harmless cloud. The archbishop collapsed to the floor, clawing at the carpet, clutching the fibers. Foam appeared on his lips, and his eyes rolled back. The corpulent body convulsed, but soon lay still, an ugly, lifeless mass. Kale cautiously approached the dead man, peered into the wide, lifeless eyes, and only then noticed he was still gripping the hilt of someone else's sword. What about your holy word? Godwin sneered, struggling to his feet. When it came to the crunch, you grabbed for the despised steel. The hunter was still swaying. The strange entity had drained almost all his strength, and he was having a tough time. You... Kale choked. The injustice stung his eyes. And now... He didn't finish, interrupted by a terrible gurgling roar right behind him. Turning slowly, he realized it was only just beginning. Robert was changing. Strangely, jerkily, unlike the smooth wave of transformation into a werewolf. Fur appeared in patches. Bones cracked and broke with a hideous wet sound, rearranging into a new form. Kale even shut his eyes, unable to bear the repulsive sight. When he dared to open them again, he involuntarily backed away, pressing his back to the wall. Before him stood a massive wolf. Kale had to tilt his head back to take in the whole beast. Its fur was coarse, dark brown, sharp. A long scar ran down its elongated snout, turning into a black stripe and continuing along its nape. And in its predatory golden eyes, there was not a glimmer of reason. A raging beast stood before them, quick, deadly dangerous, and almost invulnerable in its strange armor. I don't like this at all, Kale whispered, his voice trembling. The hunter seemed to agree entirely, but couldn't abandon his friend in yet another mess. The room was too narrow for a full-fledged fight, depriving the hunter of the ability to maneuver, and pitting strength against strength was unwise. The werewolf lifted its lips, as if in a grin, revealing elbow-long white fangs. Kyle shivered and closed his eyes again, hoping it was just a bad dream. Any moment now, Godwin would come with his usual kicks and help him wake up. The hunter didn't seem to intend to fight the werewolf. 
he extended his open palm towards the beast, as if intending to stroke it, to which it responded with a deep growl that made the stained glass windows in the room ring. In the next moment, threads of magic flew from Godwin's fingers, wrapping around the wolf's neck like a flexible noose and tightening it like a garrote. The beast howled, tried to lunge at its assailant, but only overturned the table and fell sideways when more threads wrapped around its paws, preventing it from standing. My bag, Kyle! The hunter barked, and the boy jumped, grabbing Godwin's travel bag. The vial with the blue liquid quickly. It's always hard to find something in someone else's belongings, especially when your hands are shaking. The novice didn't think long. He just turned the bag upside down, spilling its contents. He clutched the blue elixir vial with whitened fingers and, trying not to look at the enraged, bound giant wolf with mad eyes, handed the bottle to the hunter. Watching Godwin force the potion into the snapping, fang-bearing werewolf, trying to bite his fingers off to the wrist, was more than Kale could bear, and he turned away. Out of habit, he prayed to the seven gods, then spat and grimaced. It was foolish and ridiculous to hope for help from those who wanted the world's destruction. Meanwhile, silence fell behind him, interrupted only by plaintive whimpers, and the novice dared to look around. Robert had almost returned to human form, but looked utterly lifeless. His dull eyes stared indifferently at the ceiling, and for a moment, Kale thought life was leaving the powerful body. Godwin pulled a hunting knife from his boot and slashed his wrist. Thick, silvery blood reluctantly oozed from the cut and then trickled down his arm. The sharp scent hit his nostrils, and the novice barely restrained himself from recoiling. He had never liked the sight of blood, but Robert's eyes came alive, and hunger flared in them. Fierce, gut-wrenching hunger, like the flames of wildfires. Before Kale could gasp, the werewolf raised his head and sank his fangs into the willingly offered wrist. Godwin didn't flinch, didn't pull back his hand as if it were perfectly normal, just watched his friend intently. Instead, Kale felt the fear. Godwin, he whispered hoarsely, what's happening? This entity forced Robert to complete the transformation, the hunter explained calmly. As long as he hadn't tasted human blood, the beast within him couldn't dominate, and Robert could control his hunger. But given the power of the other we faced, premature awakening is quite justified. Kale stared at the hunter in incomprehension. Godwin caught his bewildered look and sighed. I'm not human, Kale, remember? He smiled wryly. Witcher blood has many properties, including the ability to quell a werewolf's madness, giving him control over his animal nature. The novice shivered. A chill ran down his spine. He glanced at the lifeless body of the archbishop and listened to the reigning silence. Are you crazy? Robert's quiet voice broke the silence. The werewolf had finally come to his senses. He had no memory of what had happened. The last thing he remembered was the dark entity hitting him in the chest. His consciousness had shattered into silver shards and faded. Now he woke, feeling Godwin's lap under his head and the metallic taste of foreign blood in his mouth. Welcome to full transformation, buddy, Godwin grinned, not worse than Robert himself. Welcome to the Monsters Club. Bastard, Robert groaned, trying to rise. His arms and legs refused to obey, and he felt like a crushed spider, wanting to gather his limbs under him but unable to do so. Get up, Godwin said sympathetically and pulled his friend to his feet. The werewolf groaned in pain and swayed, trying to keep his balance. Kale sighed and supported him from the other side, helping him move. Descending the steep stairs seemed even harder than climbing. Robert was heavy and constantly threatened to drag them down, happily counting the steps with his sensitive nose. But Godwin and Kale managed to hold on. The courtyard was slowly coming back to life. 
The witcher's spells were dissipating, and the brothers were stirring on the ground, rising, blinking in confusion, trying to comprehend and explain what had happened. So the three zigzagging figures heading for the exit didn't draw much attention, which greatly pleased Kyle. But as they finally left the inhospitable citadel of the Holy Order and crossed the drawbridge, where the familiar guards still dozed with their halberds, their attention was drawn to a cloud of dust in the distance. The keen ear of the hunter unmistakably caught the rhythmic pounding of hooves and the clanking of weapons. It seemed they had visited the destination just in time. His fears were confirmed. As soon as they stepped off the road and hid in a sparse grove near the paths, a heavily armed squad of royal guards galloped past. The decision to liquidate the Holy Order as a threat to the world's stability had been made. 